This is a conversation with Mary Anastasia O'Grady, who is a columnist and member of the editorial board at the Wall Street Journal. Mary, let's talk about freedom in the region of, the, of Latin America. What is happening with freedom of the press? Well, I, the press has been under assault in the region, I would say, for the last five to ten years. Um, the most obvious example is Venezuela, um, where the government uh, imposed a, a, a combination of, of uh, policies, both buying uh, news organizations so it could dictate the, the uh, editorial policy, and also a s sort of attacking and closing down um, organizations that didn't agree with it. So there's really no free press in, in Venezuela anymore, and as a result, it's very difficult to bring ideas to the public square and debate them. In other places in the region, like Brazil, the free press has held up very well. I think that's partly a, um, an, a sort of a consensus in society, in civil society, that the country doesn't want to go back to the times of the military dictatorship, and the press is is basically allowed to operate uh, freely. And that's true in Chile, um, and I would say it's true in Mexico as well. But in a number of other countries, there's enormous pressure, as I say, used both financially, uh, friends of the government buy um, news organizations, and the government buys news organizations, and then they um, attack the press using, uh, you know, accusations of tax collection, um, they have libel laws, all different ways of closing them down. And in the countries that are losing the most freedom, the press definitely is not a vehicle for uh, expression anymore. From a perspective from abroad, um, how do people react in these countries vis-a-vis uh, -vis this uh, siege against the press? Well, I would say that um, in most cases, uh, there's a, there's a, people feel that the freedom of the press is very important. But the problem is that the government, before it attacks the press, it's already taken a lot of freedoms away from the rest of society. So when it goes to take away the freedom of the press, um, there's no one left really that has enough power to fight back against it. So what I think is one of the big problems in the region is the press allows freedoms to be taken from the private sector in different ways because it's ideologically in agreement with the government. It allows economic freedoms to be taken away. It allows some social freedoms to be taken away. And then none of those people are strong enough to defend the press when they come to take the, the voice of the press away. And um, I think that's how it ends up collapsing. Uh, and once, you know, you control the televisions and most of the people don't read, you're just you know, basically communicating through television and the government owns that, it's really not a lot different than, say, the Soviet Union in the 70s. Mary, let's elaborate on this. What are the conditions that allow this situation? Well, it's, it happens in the intellectual sphere, I think. I mean, the left has understood this for a very long time. As I mentioned, you know, propaganda was a very important part of the Soviet Union. So their idea was to get control of universities and education and through that begin educating lawyers, journalists, uh, people who go into government and teaching them a the certain ideology about how society should operate. And then they became sort of like uh, soldiers in their army going out and, and writing from the media perspective about why, go why the society should be controlled by the government and uh, getting into the law and the judicial system. And I think this is really what ends up undermining the press, even though the press doesn't realize it. I mean, the press thinks that they're defending freedom when they're, or they're defending the good of society, this, this collective utopia that they have. And the problem with that is that in that collective utopia, no one can be free. And that includes the press. So they sort of sow the seeds of their own destruction. Is there a role for political correctness and the language in these uh, efforts? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, the pro one of the problems that people who believe in freedom face is that the utopian ideals sound so much better. And so, uh, the, as you say, the language, the narrative, it's extremely seductive. And that's why I think the, it's so important for people who want to preserve their own freedom, the freedom of the press, the freedom to choose your own destiny in life. I mean, let's remember that in the Soviet Union, 
people couldn't even choose their careers. They were told, you're going to study this, you're going to study that. And, and um, that's how limited it becomes in the end in the search for this utopia. But in the beginning, it sounds so wonderful. We're all going to be equal. No one's going to be hungry. So it's a big battle for people who believe in freedom to confront the, the long-term objectives of utopians. Um, and for sure, the, the challenge we have is to be persuasive. I mean, we can mock them, and it's a lot of fun to mock them because they have, their ideas are silly in the end. But I think we have to try to be persuasive, and we also have to try to reach people who are trapped in institutions that are very much controlled by the government, school systems being the primary uh, location for these ideas to be um, developed. It came to my mind that for most of our viewers, the Soviet Union is ancient history. Uh, have you heard stories from fellow journalists in Latin America that uh, could help our viewers to understand uh, the situation in the countries in which the freedom of the press is more suppressed? Oh, well, certainly. I mean, I have a number of them. Uh, let's think about, for example, in Ecuador. Uh, in Ecuador, the president has tried to silence the press, um, but he's done it using these libel laws. Uh, and at one point, there were three journalists, as I recall, who were facing not just very heavy fines, but also prison time. And uh, the only thing that stopped that was that there was a lot of international pressure, and he eventually pardoned them, which, uh, you know, but because he controls the courts, he was able to do that. In Argentina, uh, another a problem with uh, journalism in the, in the region is that many of the newspapers depend on government advertising in order to stay alive. And uh, in fact, the government in Argentina not only cut off La Nación, which was critical of, of the Kirchners, but it also pressured uh, uh, merchants to force them to stop advertising in La Nación. So it was a real threat that maybe the newspaper wouldn't have any advertising and would starve to death. That's another vehicle that they use to, to basically silence their critics. And of course in Venezuela, I mean, they, they actually put people in prison and um, uh, one, at least uh, one or two of the um, owners of, of uh, television stations had to flee the country um, because they are taking political prisoners now. So um, you're right, the Soviet Union is, is the past, but um, you s I mean, Cuba is, a, is an example of sort of where the Soviet Union still lives. And there the, there's really no independent press. There's some independent journalists, but they practice their craft at great personal risk. I mean, they can be beat up in the streets and they can be hauled off to prison at any time. In this environment, what is the role of the journalist? Is it the traditional role? Has it changed? I think the role of the journalist is the same it's always been, which is to report the truth of what's happening. And um, the problem is that every journalist sees the world through their own eyes. So even though you have the news side and you have editorial, uh, in some sense, even news organizations are editorializing, right? Because they're choosing which stories they're going to report on and so forth. Um, but I would say that the job of the journalist is the same. I would say the challenges that the journalists face are much greater in some places. And for example, in Mexico, uh, the state does not impose its will on the journalists. I think that the, the press as an institution in civil society is well respected and so forth. However, um, it still has control over gov some government advertising. And then the other problem in, in Mexico is that the drug cartels are uh, very uh, violent, can be very violent against journalists who do honest reporting about what's going on in the drug business. So they also are facing uh, a lot of personal peril when they try to report their stories. Let's kind of change the subject. Okay. Um, from the point of view of American readers, what are their interests in Latin America? Why are they interested? What excites them? Well. First of all, I should say that most of, I would say most of the United States looks east-west. So the tendency to look to the south uh, is not as great. But on the other hand, I think that most American businesses uh, recognize that there's more than, you know, 500 million people living in this part of the world. Uh, they're potential consumers. And um, 
governments in general in this part of the world have not done a good job in, in um, helping the societies reach their economic potential. And from that point of view, I think that American businesses are always looking for the next big break. You know, the next, which is the next country that's going to get the policy mix right so that all these entrepreneurial Latin Americans are going to be able to start their own businesses and become wealthier and also become consumers of of businesses from the U.S. So they're always looking for that. They look at Chile and they say, you know, Chile was able to put a policy mix together that actually has made Chile a developed country. I mean, it broke through more than $20,000 in annual per capita GDP, so it's an advanced country. And we would like to see another one. So I think that Americans are always sort of looking for where's the country is changing. There's a lot of excitement that Colombia is not as violent as it used to be. Uh, myself, personally, I'm very worried about Colombia. I, I don't think it has turned the corner. Um, I think there's still a lot of problems in the judiciary there. Which, and if you do not have a rule of law, you do not have a prosperous country. Um, Brazil, people were super interested in Brazil when they thought that there was going to be this big uh, breakthrough with, um, again, the policy mix that would allow all these incredibly creative and, and innovative Brazilians who are really good entrepreneurs to start really acquiring wealth and growing their businesses. We've been disappointed there again. So I think we're always looking for that change. And of course, Mexico, um, I always make a joke that says that, you know, if, if I could finally convince, you know, Americans that Mexico is not in South America, I will feel very... <laughs> <laughs> Very successful. But I think that Americans are slowly starting to see Mexico more as part of the North American continent, and particularly in business, because the, the supply chains are so connected between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. There's so much inter, um, international business between those three countries that slowly it's really starting to, to change the face of Mexico. Again, people want to see more of that. And... Um, I guess the, the big fear is the organized crime problem in the region, you know, that personal safety still remains a very big uh, issue in the region, and it's something that so far we have not been able to overcome. Having said that, uh, is it possible to make a list of the three top issues uh, about Latin America for the U.S. readers? I would say... Uh, the organized crime problem, uh, because in as much as you know, the war on drugs is sort of something that the U.S. is imposing on the region, but it also has an impact back to the U.S. So certainly the war on drugs. Um, I would say that the U.S., most people in the U.S., even if it's not true about the U.S. government, uh, are interested in greater trade with the region. Because, as I said, American businesses are looking for export markets all the time. And despite the best efforts of government, there is a rising middle class in the region. I mean, people manage, despite government, to basically become better off. So I think that access to those consumers through trade is a, a big issue for the, for the U.S. And I suppose the third one might be immigration, although I think that my own personal view is that's overblown. I mean, we need immigrants. Uh, Latin Americans come to the United States because we need the labor and it's good for our economy. Um, but that's, um, that's a social, political uh, issue that hasn't been worked out in civil society in the U.S. Um, I think part of the, the biggest problem there is that the U.S. government has not adjusted its immigration policies to take these people in legally. So you, en you end up creating a lot of people who live in on illegal and undocumented sphere. And um, that's not good for anybody. So that's something that we have to, hopefully will address in the next uh, round of presidential debates and the next presidential election in 2016. Mary, thank you for sharing these ideas and experiences with us. And thank you too.